All right. Good morning and welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. In today's show, we're interviewing Michael K. Cobb. We're going to call him Mike through the course of the show today, but if you are looking him up, you need to know it's Michael K. Cobb, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of ECI Development, Real Estate Development, Building and Financing Inspired Residences for Adventurous Souls in Belize, Panama, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, now, we're talking really exciting resort style, private villas, tiny homes, vineyards, private islands, and timber. We are going to have a fascinating conversation today, as you can tell. Welcome to the show, Michael. Oh, good. Rachel, thank you. Nice to be with you guys. And uh, yeah, it will be a fun conversation. Yeah. Excellent. And my co-host, Bruce, is also with us today. Good morning, Bruce. And how are you doing? Good morning, Rachel. Um, it, once again, it amazes me that... Um, we continue to have people on the show that are share our listeners all their experience. And, you know, I've always been fascinating, fascinated with Belize uh, because I know a lot of people have done mission work in Belize and they talk about how wonderful uh, place it is. I'm also interested in hearing more about the, uh, the timber and, uh, because I'm very well aware of Harvard. Uh, investing in the timber because here at uh, E3 Wealth, we do an endowment model of investing and we try to model it around the major endowments. And so I've heard about the, uh, the, the, uh, Harvard, um, the Harvard model of investing using um, th such things, alternative investments such that, uh, as timber. So I'm interested in hearing all this. Well, good. Well, Bruce, I, I hope maybe you'll share a little bit of your insights uh, that you've gathered over the years with me as well. So yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah. That is so excellent. I can tell we're off for a great conversation today. And um, Mike is actually in a chapel as well. So can you explain that a little bit to us? Sure. My folks live in Melbourne, Florida. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm down visiting them. And, and so the only quiet place that I could find was the chapel. So I'm in the chapel. I got the lights off, but I've got a uh, but, it, but like you said, Rachel, some folks can walk in and I'll introduce everybody to them and we'll, we'll just bring other folks in. So. Maybe we'll bring them on the show. Exactly. <laughs> that is awesome. Awesome. I love it. Well, um, for anyone who is a long-term listener of the Money Advantage podcast, you know that we like to start off our shows by giving a little bit of context. So here I'll do that very shortly because I want to get into the meat of this amazing show. So at The Money Advantage, we are a community of wealth builders, and we know that it takes a lot more than just making a great income. You want to be able to put your dollars to work in investments that are going to produce cash flow for you, and that is the path to building time and money freedom. So we're talking about an investment opportunity today, but more than that, we're talking about a mindset a mindset, I was going to say a mindset, a shift in your mindset that really can help you to think differently about investing and possibly even living and just expand your worldview about what, what investing even looks like. So I want to um, let you know this fits into the three-step process of t building time and money freedom. This is part of the last phase, putting your dollars to work to earn an income. Now, also, I want to give a brief introduction to who is Michael K. Cobb. So after success in the computer industry, Michael formed ECI Development in 1996. This residential resort development company owns projects in Belize, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Argentina, and Panama including five miles of beachfront, 4,000 acres, golf course, hotels, and residential properties. Michael contributes professionally on matters concerning international real estate finance and development. He serves on the board of several multinational companies, charitable foundations, and is a past international director for the National Association of Realtors. Michael and his wife, Carol, lived as expats, raising two daughters overseas from 2002 through 2016. So fascinating person to be on the show with us. So Michael, tell us a little bit about your, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your background and what led into this fascinating work that you do today. Uh, that's a good question. You know, um, can I just come back to like the introduction part for a second? Because I think yeah. something that's just so key, this idea of cash flow. Um, I, and I want to come back and, and, and Bruce, you brought up the, 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 the timber and that's, you know, I want to talk about cash flow in that perspective. But there's kind of two sides to cash flow, and this is something that we see as developers. There's obviously the cash flow we can earn, right? And we, and we, we tend to focus a lot on that. And we tend to focus on short to medium term. Uh, the timber is a long-term cash flow cycle, and we'll talk about that later. But the other side of cash flow is spending less, 
right? And, and where we can spend less, we need less so our cash flows can catch up or maybe get ahead of us and we can stockpile money even when we're not earning anything, you know, actively earning income anymore. Uh, and so one of the reasons that we see so many folks moving overseas is this, is this quality of life enhancement that costs less, which actually is a little bit paradoxical, right? I mean, if, if we think about a higher quality of life in the U.S., we think about spending more, right? We want to have, you know, we want to eat organics. We got to go to, to whole paycheck. I mean, I mean, whole foods, um, you know, if we gotta, right. you know, spend a ton of money on organic fruits and vegetables and all that kind of stuff. But living overseas, you can actually enjoy all of those things for, for less money than it costs to buy Cheerios and ragu sauce. I mean, it, it's incredible. So this paradox of higher quality of life, lower cost of living fits very well into your cash flow discussions. It just comes at it maybe from the backside. I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it, but, but it, 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 it's another way. It's a paradigm shift on cash flow, uh, as is the long cycle cash flow on the timber. So those are a couple of things I, I hope we can get back to at some point in the conversation. But uh, you know, absolutely. My, okay, thank you. Uh, you know, but the story is is kind of funny. So I was uh, I, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, went to a little college in Northwest Pennsylvania, Allegheny College. And after, day after college, I drove to the D.C. area, uh, camped out on a fraternity brother's couch for a few months, and got into sales uh, in computer sales, and 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 was just very lucky because I got in on the PC side of the business. Uh, you know, and this was uh, 1986. So obviously. PCs were in the ascendance. It was just a lucky, you know, happenstance. But but I did very well. And over uh, 13 years in the computer business, uh, I, I I had stayed in touch with some college friends. And a, and a, one of my roommates in college uh, was a lawyer, still is a lawyer in the Pittsburgh area, who began doing asset protection work in Belize first, and then throughout the region. And he drug me to Belize in 1994. Uh, for a little trip, he was working. He just said, come on, Cobb, come on down to Belize with me. And, and I said, okay. So I went down and I said, this place is cool. It was like Key West maybe 50 years ago back then. And I thought, wow, I get, this is awesome. Come back again next time you come, let me know. So the very next trip, a couple months later, he's going back to Belize. He and I buy our first rental properties. And this is crazy. I mean, we talk about cash flow and rental properties. I think a lot of times people think, oh, I'm going to start in the U.S., my very first rental property at the age of 30 was a condo in Belize. Oh uh, my goodness. Yeah, right? Uh, so anyway, so I, I did that. And you know, obviously I had investments in the States and all that kind of stuff too. But, but as a rental property, is a cash flow investment in Belize. And that was uh, 1994. Uh, and then uh, the businesses started to spin up. We saw opportunities to serve clients uh, many different ways in the finance side of things. Started a little mortgage company uh, that actually became a bank in 2003. Uh, and we really, I, I've stepped away from that. I'm on the board and on the management committee, but, but we've hired professional bankers to run that business. But what we saw, Rachel, uh, Bruce, was this incredible need for North American standard product that was affordable to the middle class. Uh, what, what we saw was if you had back then, if you had, you know, half a million, million bucks, you could buy beautiful product throughout the region. Um, but if you had a hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 to spend on a product, you were compromising. You were compromising a lot. Mm. And, 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 and whether it was on infrastructure or the quality of the construction or the amenities, I mean, it was just, it was, in some cases, it was just flat out miserable. And, and we said, you know what? For not a whole lot of money, you know, we can put every door handle at the right height. We can make the kitchen, you know, right? This is free. That's free, right? Or we can put the kitchen countertop at the right height so you're not bending over to cut stuff or your, your elbows are way too high. Or I mean, just all the stuff that we kind of figured out in the States over many years of standardization uh, or, I mean, what just flabbergasted me was I would walk into these because as, as part of the mortgage company in the bank, uh, my job is, is really on the loan committee. That's where I serve, you know, because I, I go inspect collateral, right? So I'd walk into this house or this condo and, and, and it was you know, maybe a refinance or a sale of an existing product. There'd be one outlet on one wall in the living room and then oh. there'd be two extension cords with outlet strips and then into the, into the outlet strip would be another extension cord to run it on around the room, right? And, and yeah, I mean, just like for, for 15 bucks an outlet, you could put one on every wall, right? I mean, it's just little things. And so uh, that's what got us into the development business. We saw a need to serve a middle-class consumer who was being poorly served and underserved, uh, and we, we could do that. And, and, and that's really been our, our business model uh, for the last 20 years, 23 years, is, is serving a middle-class consumer 
with a North American standard product. So long story, but that, that kind of rounds it up for you. Yeah. Wow. There is so much that we could talk about. I mean, you just packed so much into that about living abroad. I love that you came at this, you started with the cash flow idea. And actually I usually share our entire cash flow model, which the first level is keeping more of the money you make, which means you're being more efficient, keeping those dollars as, as you're talking about, which can include lowering your standard of living. So that is part of what, what you're talking about, that it's possible to live overseas and spend less, which is amazing. And, and then- and raise your quality of life. Which it's is not, amazing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is fascinating. So we need to come back to that idea. And then you're talking about really finding a niche and a need. And then you not only started investing overseas, which is a paradigm shift that we can invest overseas. And then you figured out how to start developing properties for other people to live and invest. So just so many threads that we can pull here. Let's talk a little bit first about what does it mean to invest overseas okay sure yeah um it you know i i think most people and let me say it in my particular case because i do so much business overseas because my business is overseas i struggle to keep a third of my investments in the u.s mm. which is very odd right i mean it, most people would would feel like having anything overseas is highly risky, dangerous, whatever. I mean, that, that, that's just the general common perception. But the fact of the matter is, is a portfolio that is US-based, 100% US-based, is actually very dangerous because it's not diversified. And, 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 and look, invest in Latin America or not, but I mean, invest in Asia, invest in Europe, invest, I mean, you know, get some money outside your home country. I assume uh, folks besides US citizens are listening, maybe Canadians listening to this as well, mm -hmm. right? But, but we need to get... My personal belief is at a minimum, 10% of our investable net worth needs to be outside our home country. 25 to 30% is probably the right amount. And it's not just, I mean, sometimes people say, yeah, I've got, I, I've got uh, BMW stock and Nestle stock, but you own it on the New York Stock Exchange. So you're not really internationally diversified, right? You have an ETF of you know, European stocks or whatever, but you're still all dollar denominated with a U.S. exchange. And, and so real international diversification includes both assets and currencies and, and being diversified outside the U.S. dollar, outside the U.S. for, for U.S. citizens um, with you know, 10, 20, 25, 30% um, it is probably very prudent. And it, it, and it probably, if you could do the correlations, and I have some, some friends who do this kind of you know, wonky you know, statistical analysis, I mean, your risk profile drops by having some of your investments overseas. Bruce, I mean, you're probably one of these uh, guys, you have a capital company. I mean, so you may understand how that works, but, um, but I think- Well, I think, yeah, he, their point is very good. And, and I'll try to summarize this real quickly for our mm -hmm. listeners. One of the reasons you want to diversify outside of the United States is our Federal Reserve has, has leveraged our currency so badly that whenever, whenever something, it's, well, it's great when it's good, but because we have it leveraged so much, it's going to be bad when it's bad. When you go, go outside of it, the currencies of like uh, different countries aren't leveraged as much. Now, there's, there are countries that have leveraged currencies in Europe and China and so on and so forth, but other countries don't have it as leveraged as much. So they're not affected uh, uh, as much by um, downswings. Plus, it's a, it's a smaller... It's a smaller economy that can uh, actually uh, pivot very much more quickly than a larger economy can. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, that's a that's a great analysis of it. And 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 I and again coming back, Rachel, to the to the to the question, right? I, I think it's just really hard psychologically for people to take that first step and make that first overseas investment. Um, but but it is critically important and. Um, and it can be small steps. I mean, baby steps. I mean, crawl before you walk, before you run. And, you know, and if every year over the next, you know, three, four, five years, you decide that you're going to take 5% of your net worth over the next five years and make, you know, five, six, seven, eight investments overseas, and then you'll be diversified with your overseas investments as well. I mean, that, that's a prudent, I mean, that's a prudent course forward and, and you can take your time doing it. You can spend your time doing your research. I mean, it, it's definitely not something you should run headlong into because mm -hmm. here's, here's the reality. I think most folks living in the U.S. are so accustomed to 
I'm just going to call it the nanny state, right? We are so protected with this regulatory body, that regulatory body. I don't know if we're really protected. I mean, it might be protection theater. I mean, you know, Bernie <laughs> Bickoff and, you know, and Enron, I mean, like they, they, these guys slip through the, you know, but, but, the, but, the, but the feeling of being protected is there. Uh, when we go overseas, we move very quickly into the land of buyer beware. And, and, and we're not used to that. In fact, I have a, a consumer resource guide that I publish uh, and if your readers want to pick up a copy, we'll, we'll send it to them for free. Um, but, but we have a whole section at the beginning entitled, you know, um, we don't know what we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. But the other side of it, which really I think relates to the investing side is we need to forget what we think we know because we bring these assumptions with us. Oh yeah, this guy must be telling the truth. Well, maybe he is, maybe he isn't or she, whatever. But because there's no truth in advertising, truth in lending, uh, the kinds of, again, those regulatory bodies that would oversee and police, you know, whatever the print or the, you know, people are saying uh, does not exist. And so we have to change how we think that paradigm. You brought up the idea of the paradigm change. If we're making investments overseas, whether it's, you know, what I would call hard investments, which is just investment, or whether it's a lifestyle purchase, we're buying a property we want to live in, um, we need to change how we think. And we've produced this consumer resource guide really as a paradigm buster more than anything else. Um, and it, it, first of all, it busts one paradigm where we're coming from North America, and then it helps to frame out better ways to think in a buyer beware environment. Uh, that's the purpose of the document. And, uh, and again, if, if your folks want to get a copy, they can reach out and we'll, or reach out to you and forward them to me. We'll, we'll send them a copy of this consumer resource guide. It, if it's, it's a great first step for anyone thinking about mm -hmm. investing or living overseas. Well, I love that you said baby steps and starting with a small chunk as well. And that's part of our philosophy, even as we talk about this whole concept of being in financial control, investing in what you know and control and being in a position of creating cash flow. Sometimes that is a complete paradigm shift from what somebody is typically doing of just trusting someone else with a 401k to manage their money and say, okay, well, I hope that I'm going to be able to retire. We're instead taking back that control and directing our investments. And so sometimes that is something that somebody enters into one step at a time. It's not something that overnight is a complete shift. And right. so you started that journey of a uh, small baby steps by visiting the country and saying, wow, this is really interesting to me. So I would like to know why, I mean, besides Belize kind of maybe um, swaying and wooing your heart from that first trip that you took, why that area of Latin America, why is that specifically a good place to be investing? Well, uh, okay. Um, I have a concept. In fact, we even in that, in that consumer guide, we actually have a section on this too. Uh, I call it the time machine. Uh, I think I, I, I mentioned at the beginning when I went to Belize, you know, 30 years ago, that sounds about right. 30 years ago, 94. Is that what? It goes, it goes about 25, 25 years ago. 25, thank you. Yeah, you're a math guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep me out of the, you know. Um, but yeah, right. The, uh, I mean, Key West, back, then, 25 years ago, I thought to myself, why? Wow. Anyway, but I, I got this idea that it was a time machine. And that really is the, uh, I think the, the, the reason the region or any part of the developing world, but, you know, in, in, in the U.S., you know, in, in the Americas, which is easy to work in, um, you know, these countries are time machines. So Belize was Key West a decade or two before. It still is, by the way. Belize is still a time machine. Uh, you know, I mean, just to give you one example, we're, we're developing a Marriott hotel on the island of Ambergris Key. Um, you know, we will have the third branded hotel on the island and about the fifth branded hotel in the whole country. And, and oh, wow. I mean, like, you just don't get these opportunities very often anymore. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the ability to go back, sort of really go back in time, knowing what this path of progress or the path of development is, having watched it or do the research, what happened in the Cayman Islands, to use a, a, a Belize example, you know, what happened in the Cayman Islands 30 years ago? Well, that's probably what's happening in Belize now, or the Turks and Caicos 20 years ago. Right, and you can see, oh, this came, then this came, then this came, and so all of a sudden, if you're trying to position yourself, you can position yourself in front of what came 
in which is what we're talking about, right? Same came, same concept. It's a British Commonwealth. It's 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 a it's a Caribbean country. It's not an island, but but there are parallels to the British Virgin Islands, Turks and Caicos, Cayman Islands. So you can actually see what happened in this, this logical progression. You can find out where Belize is in this progress, and you can put yourself in front of it. Now, you know the old adage. I mean, disclaimer: history is no you know proof for the future. Blah 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 blah. But um, but but you know, it, typically over time these things do repeat themselves and if you put yourself in the path of progress you can do well with invested in the investments and uh that that's i think what really caught me to, to be totally truthful uh i i lived in belize for six months my wife and i moved there when we bought our very first resort property in 1998 we bought a foreclosure property in 1998 i left the computer business i'd just gotten married carol my wife carol we moved to belize and we lived there for six months. And I just want to be very honest. It was five and a half months too long. <laughs> and people are like, wait a minute. <laughs> you love Belize, Mike. I do. I love Belize. I go there a week a month. I have been in Belize a week a month for 24 or five years. Oh, I wow. love Belize. But it's, not a place, but it's not a place for me to live. Now, when we moved to Nicaragua in 2002 for what we thought would be a three-year stint to start a Grand Pacifica project, after three years, my wife and I went out to dinner one night and we decided we wanted to stay. We loved it. So different countries, different regions of a country can hit your heart differently. And so what's right for somebody, and this is part of a big survey. We have a, a survey we send out to folks. It's about 115 questions. People go through it. And, and it really asks us to identify the kinds of things weather's easy people usually get weather right but but lifestyle questions do you, do you like theater um you know do you want to have big sporting events i mean just you know i mean all the kinds of questions that people might not think to ask of themselves when they're when they're really expat right investments are different from expatting but um but the uh, uh but this idea of what country are we spend time nicaragua was we were there for 14 years and absolutely loved it Six months in Belize, five and a half months too long. Great place to vacation for the Cobb family, not a great place for us to live. Um, you know, Nicaragua, great place for us to live. So just it, it, the nuance is important, I guess. I'm not even sure what you asked, Rachel. I'm sorry. That is, no, I was, <laughs> that's okay. I said, <laughs> and I'm, I'm okay. wanting to interject little because there does seem to be a little bit of an audio delay. So I just wanted to apologize if there's any um, technical challenges on listening to this show, but what everything that you have to say is just so fascinating. So I want to interject little um, because you're just sharing so much. I asked what it was like to invest overseas specifically in why you chose Latin America. So you answered that very well, which is fine. <laughs> um, but what I do want to know is if somebody is considering, I mean, there's two sides of this. You're talking about you were an expat, so you're in a position of living overseas. And I don't remember the time frame, but I think that was like 15 years, chunk of time. I mean, it was pretty substantial for you. And so living in a overseas country, so you're living out of your natural origin, your country of natural origin. So there's that. And that could potentially be a move for you to increase your standard of living and lower the cost, which you're talking about cash flow there. And then there's also this idea of investing overseas. So yeah. when you are looking at that, I, I think I heard you talk about what type of people are living overseas and that more families with young children are doing that. Yes. Was that something that, um, can you just talk about who is living overseas and who, if you are investing in these properties that you're developing, who are the people that are purchasing those properties? Yeah, absolutely. So what we've seen, uh, and we've got about, I don't know, six, 700 sales to date. So we've got a pretty good statistical sampling uh, in both Belize, Nicaragua, and Panama. I said both, but three countries, Belize, Nicaragua, Panama, about 700 sales to date. Uh, and, and then being a student of this, paying attention, we, you know, I work with other developers. I mean, just really paying attention to what's going on to understand the trends. Uh, and, and, they, and they are fairly consistent across uh, projects and other, and my competitors, right? Uh, about 25 to 30 percent of the buyers are people who are either snowbirds to full-time right so a snowbird's a wintertime user uh full-timers are obviously full-timers but i would call those buyers lifestyle buyers so about a third of the folks are truly a lifestyle buyer if you live in it full-time you do if you're a snowbird you might rent it out when you're not there 
Although a lot of snowbirds just lock it up and leave it, right? They don't want anyone in their home, right? It's their winter home kind of thing. Um, another maybe third, uh, maybe a little more than a, yeah, about a third. I mean, we're getting up to about 60%. So anyway, you, so 30% and 30% are pre-use buyers. They're buying in anticipation of use in the future. Maybe they're in their 40s and 50s thinking they're going to use it. Uh, you know, at some point down line as a snowbird or retirement home, and, and, and this works. The, uh, those folks tend to put it in a rental program because they're going to use it as a vacation property. They're going to come frequently. They might come two or three times a year for two or three weeks, I mean, or, or a month or two, but they're not lifestylers yet, but it's an anticipatory purchase. But about 40% of our buyers are really straight up investor buyers. They're, they mm. want to be in front of a trend. They, they like the fact that they can pick up a property in Belize, you know, I mean, and I'm going to use our examples, but there are plenty. I mean, uh, I mean, if you're shopping, go shopping. I mean, walk, go, to, go to Walmart, go to Target, go to Kohl's. I mean, go check out all the, all the places, right? But the examples I'll give today are, are mostly mine. But you know, we have a tiny home project in Belize. These are beautiful, tiny homes over the water, $139,000. Um, these are investment products. This is an investment product. Um, you know, you can own one, it'll rent. Now, I think one of the, one of the challenges I think that, that we face again as North Americans is this assuming that we're going to be able to pull in that, you know, nine, 10, maybe 11 kind of percent return because we're used to leverage. We're used to 3% money, 4% money in the States. So we can leverage. And so our cash on cash returns can get up into the high single, low double digits. Overseas, that's not the case. It, it, there, there is some financing. I mean, you know, I'm, part owner of a bank and, but the interest rates are high, nine, 10, 11%. So it's not a leverage type of situation. It's more of okay. a, it's a lifestyle. So people come to us and say, Hey, I need to borrow money for a couple of years. You know, I've got some money I'm cashing out of this or cashing out of that, but they want to make their acquisition. And, and, and so it, it, it's not for leverage purposes. It's to either accelerate or make up a, a, a difference in cash that they need to make the acquisition. The interest, but the interest, that's the interest rates in the region. We're, we're market, we're market competitive, but we're not competitive to a U.S. Uh, type of rate. Um, so when you go to Latin America for a cash flow investment, it's a cash purchase basically. And so if you can get real 100% payment cash on cash returns after costs in that five, six, seven percent, that's really where you're going to pick up you know the, the cash flow. It's not sexy in the way that you know double digit numbers are. But what you're going to pick up in, in, in the developing world, which you may or may not pick up in the U.S., is appreciation, right? Mm. You're buying, I mean, I always say, if you could go to, if you could get in a time machine, if H.G. Wells showed up right now in your home with a time machine and said, hey, bring one check, one check with you, we're going to go back 20 years, I'm going to let you off, you can run around, make one investment, get back on the time machine, I'll bring you back to today. Well, I think most people would come back a whole lot wealthier, right? I mean, like the United States 2020. And so the idea of being able to go to a country like Belize and look at it and go, well, what is a condo in the Cayman Islands? Or what's a, what's a property in the Cayman Islands selling for today? Or the British Virgin Islands or Turks and Caicos who have already gone through this path. Again, British Commonwealth countries, Caribbean, right? English language, all the things, English common law, the things that have really let those countries accelerate. And we say, okay, well, if I were to buy a property similar to what's selling for you know a million dollars in the Caymans today in Belize for two hundred and fifty thousand, there's a pretty good chance there's going to be some decent appreciation over the next 10, 15 years. You might triple your money in in ten years, and so you, you might not. I mean, this investment, I mean, you know, this you know, disclaimers, I guess that. But but again. This path of progress tends to repeat itself. It has repeated itself. Bermuda, Bahamas, BBI, Turks, Caymans, right? I mean, so it's repeated itself many times through the region. And, and one would expect that it's probably going to repeat itself in Belize. So while you might only pick up, say, 5%, 6% cash on cash, uh, the kind of appreciation you will see in a developing country is going to be much more significant or could be much more significant. So while that's a hard number to put into cash flows, mm -hmm. I, I think I think it is relevant um, to, to the investment experience, for, for lack of a better word. So let's talk a little bit about um, how uh, a person would then purchase this property. And then once they purchase it and they want kind of that, like you're talking about the 40-year-old that wants to do, you know, maybe come down a couple times, but really looking at 
the future. Uh, do you have property management teams that rent it out or is, or is that on them or have you taken the entire experience um, to help them out or just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. No, that, that's a great question, Bruce, because I think it's, it, it is important to understand the, the mechanics of how this works, right? And the, uh, we, we as a developer, we do offer uh, property management, which is different from rental management. Again, a lot of people are lock it and leave it. So we'll do property management, mow, walk in, I don't know, whatever, you know, once every two weeks and wipe things down, whatever it takes to just kind of maintain a property. But rental management, absolutely, we, we do that. And, uh, and, and again, everything from soup to nuts or folks can Airbnb it. We're, we're, we're very libertarian in our approach. Um, if you, if you want to use our services, if we're competitive, use us. If we're not, do it on your own. Um, m most people choose to let us do it because a, they don't really know how to do it from 2000 miles away. Um, but, but we do a pretty good job of it too. That's the bottom line. I mean, we, we do right. a good job. We keep our clients happy because you know, we can keep their units full and, and, uh, and, and then also, you know, take good care of their properties for them, uh, which is very, very important. Um, so, yeah, so, so these kinds of things are in place from us. Uh, other developers do the same thing. So it's, it's fairly widely, uh, uh, it, boy, sorry, guys. I, my, I don't, for whatever reason, my, my messenger just keeps dinging in on us. But anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm, sure people, I'm sure people aren't worried yeah. about that. That's okay. All right. Well, that's so, great. Okay. Just, uh, but let me, let me, let me throw out one cautionary tale real quick, okay. Bruce, if I could, where I think this is where this buyer beware is so important. Okay. Uh, because I, I, I mean, I know we have great competitors. Don't get me wrong. We have, we have some really great folks that just do it ethically and honestly, and they're great developers and they're my competitors. And I refer to them. They refer to me. I refer to them because different strokes for different folks. I have what's right for somebody. Great. We're going to serve them. If I don't have a product that's a good fit for the, with their desires or their needs, we refer it out. And I have other competitors that I refer to and they likewise send to us. But, but I can tell you that there are a lot of unscrupulous uh, developers. And again, they're not bound by any kind of rules, regulation, policing. And one of the, one of the, I'm going to use the word scam. I, I, it's probably not the right word, but I'm going to use it. One of the scams is people show these, uh, these performance, right? So if we do 60% occupancy for $200 a night, you know, you're going to make, you know, you know, 16% ROI. I mean, it's, it's these kind of crazy numbers, 14, 16, 20%, right? And so they're appealing to a greed factor, which, mm -hmm. you know, is, is a very powerful motivator, right? Um, but the, the, the issue that I, so in fact, in, in, our, in our consumer resource guide, we have an example and we talk about, well, if a developer who's going to mark up a product, say 25% is promising you 15% ROI, well, you could, you could knock that up another three, four points for their wholesale cost. And now you're at 20%, right? So every unit that they would keep, they would actually earn 20% cash flow. So my question just simply back to the consumer is like how, or the developer, if he's offering that, how many of these are you keeping? Yeah, right. Bruce, Rachel, you guys want every bit of 20% cash flow you can get. I do too, right? The, the issue is, is that, you know, when a developer's selling out 100% of their condo product and promising you 15 plus percent return, I think it's disingenuous because like if, if they could make 20, 21%, on that same product, I mean, I can tell you, I would sell exactly zero of them. Mm -hmm. That's the thing right. I would sell. Zero, right. Right. You're right. And so again, in the land of buyer beware, it takes this, it takes this paradigm shift of like, right. How, you know, no, 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 hold on. I can't really believe it. I can't take it at face value. I need to do due diligence. I need to ask probing questions, deep questions. Right. But mm -hmm. the problem is we don't know what, we don't know what questions to ask. Right. right. That was the first thing on my mind when you said that. Well, right. here's, here's, here's a question then that I bet a lot of people haven't thought of. I have Brenda Bermuda, the Caymans, so on and oh. so forth. And, yeah. you know, um, I can see the time machine you're talking about, yeah. but also these are, these are islands. Um, and I know Belize is not quite in that same category, but it is far away from this. So one of the things I'm curious about, okay, you, you mentioned $139,000. I don't know if that's the low end or the high end or the medium end or 
That um, was the tiny homes. I do remember he said. Ex yeah, but I don't know if that is necessarily, there's something even less than that, but that's not my point. A lot of people would see that as, oh, that sounds really great. I'm going to do that. Now, what about actually the other things that you need to put into the, the condominium to make it rental rentable, such as, you know, furniture, dishes, towels, so on and so forth. Are those readily available? And what are the costs of those acquisitions? Because I know like on, on Bermuda and Cayman, you know, kind of like goods and serve our goods are very difficult to get to or get because they're, it's an island. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, Belize is a mainland country, Amber mm -hmm. is key, uh, which is, and, 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 and it's a great, your, your question is dead spot on. I mean, it's a bullseye question. Um, you know, Ambergris Key is a little island off the coast of Belize, so it's technically a Caribbean island, uh, which has the same kinds of logistical issues Cayman BVI does, because you can bring stuff to the mainland of Belize, but then you've got to ship it by boat out to the island, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you do have the same kinds of logistical issues, um, and 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 they're real and they exist, uh, and and that's probably one of the reasons people pick you know, a property rental manager to deal with their properties because they don't want to try to figure that stuff out. I mean, like we do that for them. We're good at it. We do it. We do a lot of it. So for us, it's, it's, it's part of part and parcel of our business model. Uh, but the, uh, like, yeah, the 139 is an entry level product. I think it's at about, I think furniture and closing costs push it up to about 155, 157, something like that. Um, and, and, you know, for a lot of people, yeah, 150,000, just round number, 150,000 is probably a pretty big bite. Uh, but what we've done, we've taken three of them and we have a syndicator who's busting them up into uh, smaller units that are going to come in about 50,000 uh, for the bite. And so I think that all of a sudden, if somebody's thinking, well, 150, you know, that's a lot of money to put all in one country, one thing. Uh, but the syndication that we're working on right now uh, brings that bite size down to about 50K. Uh, for somebody who wants to, you know, to get involved. So uh, we do some things to make it far more affordable, for lack of a better word, uh, for an investor. Now, for a lifestyle buyer, you, you can't syndicate. I mean, they want to own it. They want to use sure. it, live in it, right? Uh, so, but again, a, a, an end product at, a, you know, at a 150, 175 price point on a Caribbean island, uh, you'd, pay, you'd pay three times that in, in the Caymans or BVI for, for anything similar. So uh, again, if you're looking for that Caribbean lifestyle and you have a, you know, a middle-class budget, then a country like Belize, Ambergris Key specifically is, is a phenomenal option for, for folks that, you know, that want that lifestyle experience. But as an investor, again, path of progress, you know, Belize is in the sweet spot. Uh, you know, I, I do this curve. In fact, it's in our consumer guide. It, it, it's this S curve. And, and I put the countries or even regions of a country because it, it's not like a country is not all one thing. I mean, thin slicing is really important. Ambergris Key, this little island, 26 miles long, about a mile wide, generates 70% of all the tourist revenue for the country of Belize. Wow. And so like wow. this idea of thin slice. Now for lifestyle, you might like to live in the mountains of Belize and it you know, and you don't care about how much tourism revenue. It's irrelevant. It's your, it's your home, right? Or your whatever. But if you're investing, Ambergris Key is probably where you want to look. But what I did was I put countries or parts of a country on this curve, and I did it by popularity. I, I basically said to myself, where would someone from Virginia Beach, since you're from Virginia Beach, or Missouri, uh, you know, where you are, Bruce, where would someone from just, you know, average America be likely to take their honeymoon? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is what tourism is all about. Where are people going to go on their honeymoons, right? You know, Nicaragua, way down on that, not very popular at the bottom end of the scale. Costa Rica, the Pacific side of Costa Rica, very, very high end of the scale. And then even off the scale, Caymans, BVI, Turk. I mean, they're not even on my scale because they, they're, they're mature markets at this point. But when you look at, you know, Nicaragua has almost, it has no branded product on the beach versus the Pacific side of Costa Rica, literally 30 miles away. I mean, we're talking, I mean, it's the same sun, the same sand, the same geography, everything's the same, right? Same language. One's Costa Rica, one's Nicaragua. You've got a Four Seasons. You've got a JW Marriott. You've got, I mean, you've got incredible branded hotel products. So Costa Rica is at the pinnacle, whereas Nicaragua is, you know, at, at the bottom. And again, if you're, if you're, if you want to come to central, the more Spanish speaking Central America, 
you know, there's your example of, you know, high end, low end. Costa Rica, very, very high end, mature market, place like Nicaragua, not very popular. So you can put yourself in a path of progress and Panama kind of sits in the middle. Um, Belize and Panama really are in the sweet spot of the curve because they're popular enough to get travelers and cash flow but they're not so popular that the price points have moved to the to the Costa Rica, BVI, Turks and Caicos kind of pricing. So they, they but Panama and Belize kind of sit in the sweet spot of that popularity curve, as, as I call it. That's yeah. just fascinating to think even about um, understanding the lay of the land and the popularity, where the tourist revenue is coming in, where people want to go, and then thinking about putting dollars to work and yep. I really love how you keep referring to the consumer resource guide as well, because that's something that somebody could get to be able to increase their knowledge about Absolutely. this type of investment so that they could do that with control. Um, Bruce, did you have a question there? I wanted to um, lead. Well, I was just saying one of the things, second. well, one of the things I would think that also would be exciting about Belize is uh, Southwest airlines. You know, I think yep. has now been made that a stop for about the last three years or so. Got and it. so so they actually see a market into that place also. So I think that's another indication of the uh, the future for them. Well, it, it, very good point. And, and what we saw with Southwest opening up, yeah, three years ago um, was a couple of things. One, the price of other tickets dropped, right? I mean, they, they're a price buster. So they come in and force right. United Delta and American to drop their numbers, which is great for the consumer. Um, but what we've seen in the last about four years now is that airlift to Belize more than doubled in the last four years. Inventory went up by about 16 or 17 percent. I can't remember the exact numbers, but we have we have white papers on Belize. We've got a lot of resources by way, not just the Consumer Resource Guide. We've got country handbooks. We've got white papers. We believe in educating the client, giving them the information. So, um, but yeah, I mean, so airlift doubled inventory went up 16, 17%, supply demand imbalance. I mean, it, again, this, this idea of the sweet spot, Belize really is sitting in a sweet spot right now for, for many reasons, but, but very, very tactically, right? Strategically, big country, all that kind of stuff, right? Tactically, airlift doubled, inventory went up 16, 17%. Yeah, yeah, it's it's in the sweet spot, yep. And although, and although it's not 100%, the way that Belize sits, um, uh, the, the 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 yeah. ability for it to be hit by a hurricane is not as great as out in the open water or even on some of those other coastal company uh, um, countries because it has that it sits kind of into that bay just a little bit so when the hurricane comes around counterclockwise it would go over the landmass and slow down before it would get to Belize. You're absolutely right. They they get far fewer hurricanes than just Cancun, 150 miles to the north. For that exact reason, right? Bruce, are you a study of, student of geography? That, that was pretty well, good. Well, I actually, I'm a, I'm a ex a science teacher that used to teach meteorology. There you, okay, so, all right. So, That's you, where you're getting that from. I thought maybe you were just studying the news and the the weather, and I, I'm thinking I need to look up exactly where Belize is because honestly, I'm not sure. I did do one cruise in the Caribbean, but that was I think on the opposite side, but I'm not exactly sure. So I need to I need to double check my geography here. Rachel, Rachel, can I make you feel a little bit better? So yeah. when my friend Joel, this, I'm sitting in the computer business, I'm in Springfield, Virginia, sitting at my desk on a Tuesday. My friend Joel calls me up, the, the, the lawyer in Pittsburgh. He calls me up. Hey, Cobster, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing? Whatever. He says, I'm going to Belize on Thursday. The doctor that was supposed to come with me uh, can't come. Uh, do you want to come with me? And I said, absolutely, man. And then, no. But I mean, this is long before Google. Now I'm sitting there. I've said, yeah, I'm coming to Belize, Joel. And, and I'm thinking to myself, where's Belize? <laughs> you and I, we're good on this. We're, we're good, Rachel. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, the relationship and the opportunity must have sounded so good. The location didn't matter at that point, right? Uh, just a trip with Joel, a junket for the weekend. I'm like, yeah, man, let's go. Uh, Love it. So um, we've got a lot of ground that we've covered, and I feel like we could talk to you for a very long time. I do want you to mention something about the long cash flow cycle with agriculture um, agricultural land and teak um, real briefly. And we do have eight minutes before we need to wrap up fully. So, um, oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you so much for having me. I mean, if we get to the end and I haven't said thank you, thank you. I, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Um, awesome. Thank fun. you. Yeah, you're welcome. This is fun. Um, 
the, uh, 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 the, the long cycle, I mean, we tend to think about cash flow short term, you know, we get our paycheck every two weeks, or if we have rental properties, we get our money, you know, once a month. And, and if we have stocks and bonds, maybe we get an annual dividend, or we, you know, we sell some stocks once, once a year or something, and, or two years or whatever. So we've got the sort of two week, one month, one year, two, three year kind of cash flow models in our minds. But, but agricultural products and timber specifically, and it's interesting, Bruce, that you, you, you follow a, you know, an endowment model with investments. I think that's brilliant. Your clients are so fortunate to have you thinking this way for them. Um, but, but this idea of generational wealth stewardship uh, mm -hmm. really follows a model of long cycle cash flow. I, I, I speak at a lot of conferences and I can see the snickers and the eye rolls whenever I say this. I say, yeah, 25 year teak investment is a phenomenal cash flow investment. Canadian Snickers, the eye rolls, whatever. But but the reality is is that teak cash flows. Timber generally, teak in this case, cash flows. It just cash flows once every 25 years. Well, that's cash flow. And the beautiful thing about this long cycle cash flow is that, you know, if if uh, you know when, it's not if, when I kick the bucket and, and, you know, and my kids or grandkids, you know, get a bunch of money from, from, you know, from me, if it's in IBM stock, they can sell it and go buy a, you know, Ferrari tomorrow or, or, you know, $10,000 sunglasses, whatever they will waste it on. Right. And then the money's just gone. Whereas with something like Teak, yeah. You know, when they, when that big harvest comes and they get their million dollars from the first harvest or whatever the number is, they can go buy Ferraris and expensive sunglasses, but the Teak gets replanted. And then in 25 more years, their kids hopefully might be a little more, you know, wise and prudent than, than my kids. I'm picking on my kids. But anyway, but you get the point. Like one generation, the next generation, that, that it repeats every 25 years. And so what you're doing is you're stewarding wealth to future generations that will hopefully be responsible and prudent with their choices of what to do with that money when they receive it. Um, but even if they're not, it's okay. It gets replanted and there's another chance in the future. Um, and, and you're right, Bruce, these endowments, uh, they get that. I mean, they're, they're stewarding money for, for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. And, 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 and there the bite size is incredible. Uh, we, have, we have baby, we call it baby teak. It's going to be planted in uh, January, February of this year in Panama. We just bought a new piece of property. You know, back in 1999, I planted 100 acres of teak uh, with with uh, five other investors, six of us, right? We planted a hundred acres of teak for our children, our grandchildren. Legacy planning, right? It's that you know, it's going to produce every twenty five years, kind of forever. What forever is, but um, uh, we uh, those those trees are now twenty years old, and we we uh, you know we're just so happy that in five more years we're going to have a big harvest. Right. But we went out and bought a new farm uh, 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 this fall. It has some 14-year-old teak. It has some empty land that we're going to plant baby teak. Nice. 14-year-old teak, uh, 1,000. Uh, it's like a, it's uh, 1,000 square meters, which is roughly a quarter acre, uh, is is you know fifteen thousand uh, dollars. A baby teak for the same thing, a quarter acre of baby teak that has the full 25-year cycle is uh, under seven thousand, sixty-eight hundred and something. So so from a bite size perspective, people want to you know take that first nibble at something overseas, but also, again, move into a long cycle cash flow. Uh, I mean, it's kind of, it's a double thing, right? It's a foreign investment. Um, it's a hard asset. It's agricultural, but it's also uh, uh, this long cycle cash flow, which most people don't have any of it in their portfolio. Uh, so it kind of, maybe it, it ticks three boxes or something like that. Mm. So. You know, I love that you're sharing this. And part of it is that we talk about privatized banking on a regular basis. That's one of the majority of the things that we do. And our clients are always talking about needing and wanting long-term wealth builders. And yeah. most of all of the people that we connect with and that are attracted to our message are people who care tremendously about their family and the legacy that they're leaving on to future generations. And so just having that mindset of creating long-term wealth with your investments then gives you an amplified value because if you are putting your dollars into specially designed life insurance, you're building up that cash value, then we're always looking for what are the ideal investments that you can use that cash value to borrow against your policy and then be able to put those dollars to work in alternative investments. And so Teak would be an opportunity that you could use these international investments through ECI development, these are, um, we want to bring more of these type of opportunities to your awareness as a listener, because these are just expanding your thinking in terms of what is actually possible for you to use your cash and your cash flow for. 
So um, as we wrap into a close, and I feel like this show was way too short, there was just so much more that we could cover here. Um, we we want to make sure that our listeners can find and follow you. And I know you said Michael K. Cobb, C-O-B-B. Um, also, I want to make sure that we have your website, ecidevelopment.com. Um, I want to make sure that if there's anything else that you'd like to offer our listeners, you mentioned the consumer resource guide, you mentioned uh, the survey with 115 questions, you mentioned the country handbooks. I just want to make sure that they have everything they need to be able to connect with you and plug into your resources. Sure, sure Rachel. Thank you. Uh, it's easy. MCOB, M-C-O-B-B at ecidevelopment.com. Uh, and if you want the consumer guide, just subject line consumer guide. If you want information on Belize handbooks, by the way, we produce handbooks on Belize, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Ecuador, Chile, and Argentina. So these are handbooks. These are guidebooks. They're, they're not sales documents. So about the country, restaurants, hotels, train schedules, bus schedules, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so we country handbooks. Uh, and then if you want the survey, you actually have to go online and, and, and take it online, but then you get the results. So I uh, will send you the link. So uh, country handbooks, consumer guide, uh, surveys, all of the above, just put something in the subject line that'll let me know what it is. And I will forward those to people uh, in the organization who will get right back to you and provide that, that information. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, thank you so very, very, very much for taking your time on your vacation with your family to um, spend time in a chapel and make this conversation happen today. I really appreciate that. And I'm completely inspired. I have wanted at some point to live overseas. And so that's um, probably something that you have made a little bit more relevant and possible just with you sharing your experience. Yeah, so, thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. And in closing, remember, success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd, and build a life and business you love.